He is risen. Who am I? It is important that we should resolve the question of identity first. Who am I? When Jesus of Nazareth was about to be seized and taken, they came out against him as against a criminal, a common criminal with swords and staves. He said, I taught daily, openly, and in the temple. Why do you come out against me with swords and and staves. We recall then from his life and that particular time that as they came toward him and approached him, no one seemed to be able to identify Jesus. You all remember that Iscariot, of course, had to come up and betray him with a kiss. Have you ever stopped to wonder why Iscariot had to kiss him if he was so well known? Now, I'm sure that any of you people wouldn't have any difficulty identifying Dean Martin or Frankie Sinatra or President Nixon we all know exactly what they look like. But you should remember that in those days we did not have television. We did not have the printing press. We did not have widely distributed art of famous figures. And many of the people knew these people only by repute, having never heard them personally. And so Jesus, with his beard and mustache, was a rather obscure figure in the minds of many people obscure in the sense that he was no different than the other apostles. So they came out to take him. And you must take note of one particular thing that happened. He said, in answer to their question, they said, whom seek ye? This is what he said. And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. And when he said, I am he, it is recorded that they went backwards and they all fell to the ground. They all fell to the ground. What dynamism was in this man's voice or in his simple answering of the question, I am he? that would evoke such a response, that would be so overpowering as to make these soldiers and people who came against him to fall back to the ground. Why, it was the power, of course, of his realization of his oneness with the Father. He was aware of the fact that is identical with the statement in the Bhagavad Gita Never the spirit was born, the spirit shall cease to be never, dead though the house of it seems. So you see, the deathless, birthless spirit, the almighty power of life that beats your heart, is the I am he of all of you, as well as it was the I am he of Christ. The difference between us and Jesus is that he never forgot it, and we do. When we are hurt by other people, when our feelings are wounded because someone does not recognize us, or we think they don't, it is entirely because we do not recognize ourselves that we are hurt. If we recognized our oneness with God, how could we be hurt by the actions of any other person who also recognized their oneness with God. If we have oneness with God, we are all complete. Somebody told me one day that they had a certain food, that it had all of the protein complement in it. 
Everything was there, that if I would eat this food, that my body would be nourished, and every part of my body and every part of the cells would be nourished because it was a complete and total food. Well, I can say that this is perhaps a very dim and poor analogy of the fact that if we recognize our oneness with God, that there is no question in my mind whatsoever that the full greatness of God would shine through our lives. You understand this. There wouldn't be any question about it. It is necessary if the Christ is to rise from the dead in us as an individual that we understand the difference between the universal Christ and the Christ of ourselves, the individualized Christ. Many people have become confused by the mission of the great master Jesus. They are confused by his mission. But if they would only stop and think of his own words, they would find the answer. There have been distortions, of course, in the translations. But here's what he said. Before Abraham was, I am. Now you probably have never stopped to think of the fact that you yourself could have said it because you probably don't think in those terms. Most of us don't. I heard recently of a party that said that they had come from the central sun on this planet that lives in California. Well, one of the ladies to whom this was said, when this lady told her that she was from the central sun, she turned to her and said, aren't we all? I think it is very important. I think Abraham Lincoln captured it quite well when he referenced the common man. God made us all of one blood that dwell upon the face of the earth. And those who would accentuate our differences are not accentuating the Christ because the Christ reality that lives in the universal, that is the universal, by which all things were made, lives in us individually as much as he lives in the universe. The macrocosm is there, but the microcosm is here. And St. Germain has said, I am here, and I am there. Om Tat Sat. We have to recognize that I am that I am. We are that I am. When we say I am he, when we say I am, when we conceive of our reality, it is necessary that we identify first with the universal, and then don't forget to identify with yourself as an individual drop of the mighty ocean. Do you see this? This is very important because if the resurrection is only celebrated in so far as Jesus is concerned, we are missing his appointment. We are missing our appointment with Christ. Behold, every eye shall see him. And when we shall see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. How can you be like him if you do not see him? And how can you see him unless you see him in yourself? Therefore, our role is not to damn or condemn ourselves, which is the greatest tool of the powers of darkness on the face of this earth, self-condemnation. Right now, all over America, classes in sensitivity training are being held. The sole purpose of sensitivity training is to bring man down to the lowest common denominator, to make him a mediocre person, a part of the mass plasma. He's supposed to be just a part of the masses. We are individuals. The sovereign right of the freedom breath that lives in us intends to keep us as individuals all the way back to the central sun, all the way back home. We don't have to be afraid of losing our identity. God and Jesus Christ and every master on in the universe, 
is interested in all of us maintaining our identity. But it is an identity that ought to become a creative fount of reality. Do you understand this? In other words, our identity should be an orifice. What is an orifice? An opening. Our identity should be an opening through which the power of God can pour. The body of God. We the pours, you see, the pourers. The energy flows through us, but it has to be according to the pattern which I have shewed thee eternal in the heavens. And this pattern which I have shewed thee eternal in the heavens is the power that appeared to Moses in the Sinai desert and said, when he asked him, who are you? He said, I am that I am. You, each one, should understand the power of the I am, the power of identity, the power of being. The big problem in the world today is personality. The powers of darkness, one, to cause people to be divided into fragmented portions. The power of God wants to unite, but be very careful when you start to unite, because a union that is, as I have said before, and I will say it again, simply a physical union, like tying two cats' tails together and throwing them over a clothesline. You have union, but you do not have unity. And this is what we have to remember always, is that it is not just to be joined physically to something, but to be joined spiritually because you can fool yourself a great deal in a physical union, but you can never fool yourself or anybody in a spiritual union, because this is real. Spiritual unions are real. They're real. They're not earth-earthy. They're heavenly. So the resurrection, he is risen. Who is it that rose? I go back then to the old statement about who is it that was born in Bethlehem. Unless Christ is born in us individually, it doesn't make a bit of difference that he was born in Bethlehem. And you can see today exactly what is taking place in the world. You are experiencing a very strange killing of Christ that is going on every single year. Certain people in this world are dedicated to the death of Christ because they know that if they can kill Christ off, in the minds of the people, by making religion unpopular, which is the most important thing there is in the world or the universe, they can finish this civilization. Do you understand? We must make Christ live in ourselves. He's there. He says, I am at the door. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. He who will open the door to me, I will come in and I will sup with him and he with me. This is the meaning of it all. We must not allow in America or anywhere else in the world the Christ to be killed off. Christ came to both Jew and Greek and Gentile. You understand? He came to all, to the bond and the free. And he is the hope of the world. Without Christ, we may just as well close our doors and write our own epitaphs because all our life will consist of we'll be eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage and when the supposed fun is over which often becomes very questionable you know what I'm talking about all the joys of life become questionable if you're not happy and if they're dependent upon the fulfillment of desires alone they are not happy because when the desire is fulfilled you're face to face with a bottomless pit. What is the bottomless pit? Have you ever wondered about it? You ever wondered about the bottomless pit? The bottomless pit is nothing more than desires that can never be fulfilled. You just keep on wanting something all the time and you're never satisfied. Well, if you have God seeing that he made everything, you've got everything. There isn't anything you lack when you've got God. And he's not so far away. You live in him. You move in him. Yet, strange dichotomy. Strange dichotomy. In my pocket, I have a book on Shakespeare. The master told me that I should open it up 
and see what lines we can find here. Now, I don't know what he has in mind. He, I work strictly. Listen to this. Love is my sin, and thy dear virtue hate. Hate of my sin, grounded on sinful loving. Oh, but with mine compare thou thine own state and thou shalt find its merits not reproving. Or if it do, not from those lips of thine that have profaned their scarlet ornaments and sealed false bonds of love as oft as mine, robbed others' beds, revenues of their rents, be it lawful, I love thee as thou lovest those. Whom thine eyes woo is mine importune thee. Root pity in thy heart, that when it grows, thy pity may deserve to pitied be. You see, we are actually facing the enigma of the Sphinx. Man, know thyself. So long as we don't know ourselves, we don't know who he is or who we are. But we think we know who he is, and we think we know who we are. But we really know neither. So to really know is not just to meet. I have people who meet me and shake hands with me. Or they have a conversation with me. And they go away saying, I met Mark Prophet. This is the way he is. Well, I would not, <laughs> I would not think so shallow a pan as one little conversation would be, could compose the mightiness of the soul. Nor would I think it of thee, any of thee. I would not think that anyone in this room that I would have a conversation with could in that conversation give me the fullness of what they are or telegraph it to my consciousness. I consider that there is too much depth in everyone because God has made us. We are like a grand canyon of reality. We are like a whole beautiful world filled with people. We are individuals, but we are peopled with the many lives that we have been. We are peopled with the many lives of thoughts that we still have within us. And all of this needs metamorphosis. All of it needs the power of change. And so, when we say he is risen, let us always remember that what we should seek is the resurrection of the Christ in ourselves. Because then we will be entering in to the great adventure that he himself experienced. We need then to understand St. Paul's statement, I die daily. We must die to many of the things of the world that in their own way, like weeds, will ultimately destroy the garden of our reality. We need to guard ourselves against false starts. We need to improve ourselves and our methods. All of this can be done effectively and surely if we will believe that Christ is in us as a seed if we will believe that we ourselves need to die to many things that we have been involved in in the past. One great Indian avatar said, the lives of all men are full of many shames. Yes, but let's not allow the dark powers to work that strange miracle of condemnation. I call it a strange miracle because it's no miracle at all. The only miracle about it is that so many people respond to it. They go out here and they make a mistake. I don't care what it is. They get hooked on cigarettes. They get hooked on dope, some of them. They get hooked on fancy plays or playing the field with women and all kinds of things. They get hooked. And you see, after they get hooked on it, then because they've made a mistake, they feel guilty because they've made a mistake and they say to themselves, well, you know, you made a mistake the night before last or a week ago or 10 years ago. And so they decide 
well, as long as I made a mistake, now I might as well not try to be good anymore. And that is the devil's chief tool. It's discouragement. Why, for goodness sakes, Mary Magdalene, who was a prostitute, let me say it. Mary Magdalene was one of the chief disciples of Jesus. She was received by him. He loved her, not for something outward, but for the inward glow that was within her heart. He quickened in her the spiritual responses. None of us, then, are without stain or shame. We've all made mistakes, but that doesn't make any difference with our all-loving Father. Remember the return of the prodigal. Just be careful you don't do as Rasputin did. Rasputin used to say, it feels so good to sin because it feels so good to be forgiven. I don't believe that any of us should ever follow that line of thought. That is, of course, deceit at its worst. Therefore, we should be very careful that our orientation is genuine. I say genuine. And if it's genuine, you know very well that you can't simply by wishing increase your stature. Which of you, Jesus said, can add so many inches to your height by wishing? You can't do it. How many of you can change the number of hairs in your head? You cannot. Oh, you can pull a few out. Sometimes you feel like doing it. But the whole point here is that you are no better or no worse than what you are at a given moment in time. The important thing then to remember, and I want to stress this to all of you, is not to stop the flow of the stream. Don't dam it up. Just make sure that you're making progress. That's all. Don't worry about yesterday. Don't worry about your failures. Don't worry about your frustrations. Just be hopeful and know that the resurrection spirit that lived in Christ lives in you. It is working out its destiny in you right now. You don't have to see it all. God sees it. You may see a little of the working. Be glad when you do. But even if you didn't see any at all, if you have faith that it is there and that it's working, you're going to enrich in your life automatically. It cannot be avoided. So as we go forth now, let us do so with a sense of joy that this conference in time, today, in the year of our Lord, 1970, this Easter is just as meaningful in the eyes of God as it was that golden dawn when the angel rolled the stone away from the tomb. There will be angels at this conference, I can tell you that. And there will be stones rolled away from human hearts. People here and in Santa Barbara and in America and in the world will feel the flow of light as we invoke the angels to come down and descend. And when those stones roll away, you'll see the glow. And the Christ will step forth in you. And you'll feel the flow of his light. And if you can just keep that light captured in the bottle of consciousness and carry it not only to India, but all the way through your whole line of progress in the forward march of progress, you'll be better and better and better. As my little girl said one day to her mother, she says, Daddy is getting louder and louder and louder. And so you'll get better and better and better. And that's the objective. Remember that. If you can keep that vision, you won't be fooled by the net that comes along and says, well, come see, come saw. You did such a terrible thing yesterday. You were very harsh to this person. You made a terrible indiscretion 10 years ago. Forget it. Don't worry, the keeper of the scrolls is going to remember it. <laughs> you don't have to remember it. At the right time, the balance will come up. And maybe if you are good, maybe 
as in the case of the great yogi Lahiri Mahasha, who was actually uh, from Benares, at the Vedic fire ceremony, where the people are gathered around for the Vedic ceremony, suddenly the great master Babaji reached over and took a burning brand. He reached over to a bare shoulder of one of the men there, and he just shoved that right into his shoulder and burned him with it. Lahiri Mahasha looked at him and he said, Sir, how cruel! What did he say? The great Master Babaji said, Would you rather see him burn to ashes before your eyes according to the decree of his karma? But by a little suffering the law is served. So how do we know then? But what, as we turn to the light and embrace the light, God will mitigate our suffering. Our pain will become less and less. But if we listen to that old horn fella, and we say, well, you did something, and so you might as well do something more, then it's like playing poker where you don't have any money. You're borrowing all the time. You're going in debt. And the chips are being stacked against you. Life is quite simple. If we would only live it according to the consistent principles of common sense, which is not actually too common at all. It's very uncommon. It's not used. So then, let us develop and feel that Christ is in us now, that Christ will be in us through this conference, that Christ has always been in us, that Christ will be with us forever. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. Thank you and God bless you.